Well, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're about ready to get going with our next session. Um, and for me to introduce our next speaker, Rachel Botsman. Rachel is one of the world's leading authorities on how technology is transforming human relationships and what this means for life, work, and how we do business. She's been recognized as one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company magazine and as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Um, and her first book, What's Mine is Yours, the ideas that she uh, put forward in that book was named one of Time's 10 Ideas That Will Change the World. Her latest book is called Who Can You Trust? And today she's going to be talking to us about some of the ideas that she puts forward in that book, specifically revealing why she believes we are at the tipping point of one of the biggest social transformations in human history and what the implications are of these changes for business. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Rachel Botsman. Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be in this beautiful place with you all. And to do, today, I'd like to talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about, which is a trust shift that is happening in our world today. A trust shift where trust is shifting from institutions to individuals. And what the shift is doing is it's turning the way trust is built, managed, lost, and repaired upside down. Before I get started, um, I'd like to get a little bit of a sense of all of you. So we're going to do a very quick exercise. Um, it's very painless, trust me. So let's start with an easy one. Could you raise your hand if you have ever been a guest on Airbnb? That is a lot of you. Okay, so um, let's do this the other way around. Who has been a host on Airbnb? Raise your hand. Okay, far less of you because it actually requires more trust to be a host than a guest. Um, let's, look at the, let's find out the early adopters in the audience. So anyone own Ethereum, the cryptocurrency Ethereum? Okay, a few people. Bitcoin, a few more people. And you don't have to tell me what you've bought, um, but has anyone been on the dark web? Like few people like half raising their hand because they don't quite want to raise their hand. So I'm going to explain how all these ideas are connected and how um, they are connected by the fact that technology is enabling us to trust strangers in all kinds of fascinating ways. Um, I thought I'd start with a story. And the story is a very important story to me because when I started researching this idea of trust, I asked myself, where this fascination had come from. Why was I so interested in how we place our faith in strangers, in new ideas and new things? And what I realized is that it started at a very, very young age. So around the age of five, um, my mum decided to go back to work. And like many women who go back to work, she needed to hire someone to look after myself and my brother. So does anyone watch Downton Abbey? Just raise your hand. Oh, raising your hand. Okay, so you'll know that um, The Lady is this magazine, a posh magazine, where high society, they hire their gardeners and their butlers. And my mum, for some bizarre reason, because we are not high society, she decided to find a nanny in The Lady. And I'll never forget the woman who eventually got the job, because her name was Doris. And she walked into our house and she had this big mop of curly hair, and she had these steel glasses and a very, very thick Scottish accent. But the thing I remember is that she was wearing a Salvation Army uniform, complete with a bonnet. Now, these things are very important. These things are what we call trust signals. And trust signals are things that we all use. They are clues or symbols that we knowingly or unknowingly use to decide whether someone is trustworthy or not. The problem is that we often tune in to the wrong signals. Some signals are louder than others. Now, Doris lived with us for almost a year. And she was actually a very good nanny. She, um, she was cheerful, and she was reliable, and for the most part, responsible. And there wasn't anything suspicious about her. And then one weekend, she disappeared. And by the third day, my parents were getting quite worried. 
So they went, my dad went round to our neighbor's house, and his name was Mr. Luxembourg, and they said, do you know where Doris is? And he said, that's so funny that you've come round, because we've just discovered that your nanny and our nanny are running one of the largest drugs rings in London. <laughs> now, <laughs> what happened next is really so unbelievable that you have to trust me that it is true, um, but it is true. So now my parents are hoping that she doesn't come back, right? They've searched her room and they found all kinds of things that you really don't want laying around the house with a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. And the police come round and they arrest my dad because Doris doesn't belong to the Salvation Army. She's robbed a bank and she's used our Silver Family Volvo estate as the getaway car. Now. <laughs> I love this story because I like to remind my parents that they left me in the care of a drug dealing armed bank robber. <laughs> They're actually here today and I can see that they've got their heads in their hands, so <laughs> don't ask them to choose childcare for you, it's not a good thing. But anyway, there is a serious point to this story and the serious point is because they are smart, rational people and they usually make good decisions. So I started to wonder in my research, how could they have made such a bad decision? And I realized through talking to them, something really important when it comes to trust is that they thought they had enough information to make a decision about her, when in reality they faced a trust gap. And this is something I think is very profound that is happening in the world today that the illusion of information is far more dangerous than ignorance. One of my favorite trust theorists is a gentleman called Diego Gambetta, and he put it so well. He said that trust has two enemies, not one. The first is bad character, and the second is poor information. So the question that I started to ask myself was, can technology make us smarter about who we trust? Or is it encouraging us to place our trust in the wrong people and the wrong places? Now, I think this is a very important question that we need to be answering in society. And let me explain why. OK, we're going to do another quick exercise. Um, <laughs> you know where this is going, right? <laughs> um, it's a highly sophisticated exercise, and it's called the trust barometer. And the way it works is you each get one boo, only one boo, and you have to boo for the person that you think is the least trustworthy on this slide. Now, I had to, you know, I had to get a bit of competition here, right? So if you think that Harvey Weinstein is the least trustworthy person on this slide, say boo now. That was pretty strong. I think you're going to use two boos. I think you're going to cheat. If you think President Trump is the least trustworthy person on this slide, boo now. Boo! Oh my God. Th this gentleman is really loud boo. OK. Um, if you think, um, some of you might know this, this uh, lady, this robot. Her name is Sophia. And she was recently given citizenship in Saudi Arabia. So if you think that Sophia is the least trustworthy person on this slide, say boo now. A few people. Okay, but the robot, I'd like to point out, is more trustworthy than the President of the United States, but that's okay. All right, we're going to do this in reverse. Um, this is the trust barometer in reverse. You now get to clap. Um, so I'd like you to clap for the company that you think is the most trustworthy company on this slide. I know it's a bit harder. So um, if you think Google is the most trustworthy company on this slide, clap now. Okay. Facebook. <laughs> Do you work for Facebook? <laughs> no, I'm joking. OK, Amazon. All right, so um, I think we have a clear winner there, that Sophia and Amazon. Um, now, this is really interesting, because this is a rubbish exercise. And I was waiting for someone to say to me, what are you tr what to do what? You're, they're the most trustworthy to do what? The least trustworthy to do what? And this raises a really important point. Because the way we talk about trust is in these very general abstract terms. But trust is highly contextual. So I can trust that 
Harvey Weinstein will make great films. I don't necessarily trust him around women. I can trust that Donald Trump will tweet something ridiculous at 3 a.m. <laughs> but I don't trust him to negotiate with North Korea. Now, I think a lot of you are clapping around Amazon, which I think is really interesting because you trust that when you place an order on Amazon, it will arrive on time. But you may not trust them to pay taxes. And so this is really important because the way we talk about trust isn't helpful because trust is so contextual. Now, the reason why I did that um, actually had a serious intent is because you've probably seen this narrative. You've probably seen these surveys. Um, this one is from Edelman, and Pew have done similar ones, Gallup and Ipsos, and they're all telling the same story, and that is that trust is in a state of crisis because trust in major institutions, so charities, um, the media in particular, uh, government, big business, is in a, a whole, sorry, an all-time historic low. And I encourage you to, when you look at these surveys, to think of that point around trust being contextual. Because the way the surveys work is they say, well, do you trust the media? Now, someone's media could be the New York Times, and another's media, person's media could be Mumsnet and Reddit. So you really have to dig into what these surveys are saying. But these surveys, they're all saying the same thing. And it's a worrying pattern that we're seeing this decline of trust in society. And recent scandals haven't helped, you know, whether it's the Equifax data breach or the Paradise Papers. But they're just all symptoms of the same cause, the same problem. And that is this institutional trust, this trust that really is the at the foundation of society, it wasn't designed for the digital age. This idea that trust, largely taken on blind faith, placed in the hands of the elite and privileged few, and a trust that can operate behind closed doors, doesn't work in the digital age. So one of the things that I wanted to understand is what is really driving this breakdown of trust? And is this breakdown of trust, are the reasons similar for media and, say, charities? And what I discovered was that there are three key reasons why we're seeing this erosion of trust. The first is pretty obvious. The first is about a lack of accountability. Why is it that it seems like often people in power, the elites, often the rich, that they get to play by different rules? That when something goes wrong, there aren't serious penalties. And you see this come out. So people say, you know, why was it after Vol uh, Volkswagen's diesel gate? Why did the CEO get to walk away with a multi-million pound paycheck? Why was it after the great financial crisis that only one captain of finance went to jail? Why is it that Equifax get to write their own report about what happened? And a lack of accountability is very dangerous when it comes to trust because it erodes people's faith that anything has changed. They feel like this may have happened, but the system has stayed the same. The second, and I'm going to talk more about this later on because I know it's very topical at the moment, is this idea of echo chambers and fake news. And the first thing I say is they're often spoken about in the same breath, and they're very, very different things. So echo chambers, as I'm sure you're all aware, is because the internet sorts us into online neighborhoods. But in those online neighborhoods, we're often hanging out with people with similar views. And why is this dangerous? Because we find the information that verifies our fears, often baselessly. We find the information that amplifies our anger. And what happens is this cycle of distrust becomes magnified. And once the cycle of distrust like we're in becomes magnified, it becomes like a disease. It becomes like a virus that spreads through society. And once you have a trust breach, the next phase is an erosion of faith an erosion of confidence in the system. And then after that is when society enters a precarious place, was when institutions start to lose legitimacy. And that's what we're starting to see, whether it be with media or with government. 
And now the third driver is sort of amplifying what's happening with online information. And it's, some people call it twilight of the elites. I like to think of it as an inversion of influence. And the easiest way to think about this is that for a long period in history, um, the people we were influenced by were we used to look up, right? Whether it was to CEOs, to economists, to experts, to academics, to people in power. And we're seeing that influence being inverted. Now, I'm going to show you a quick clip. And it's from a gentleman, a politician called Michael Gove. Um, just raise your hand if you know who Michael Gove is. OK, so um, Michael Gove was very influential during the Brexit campaign. He's a British politician. I have nothing in common with him. Um, but he was on an interview with Sky News. And he said something to the journalist that really stuck in my mind. And I'd like to play for you the clip, because what he said was that people in this country have had enough of experts. People don't trust experts anymore. So let me show you the clip. He, he and the journalist take a while to get warmed up. Um, but this is Michael Gove. Hang on a second. Why should the public trust you over them? I'm not asking the public to trust me. I'm asking the public to trust themselves. I'm asking the British public to take back control of our destiny from those organisations which are distant, unaccountable, elitist and don't have their, elitist, um, their own elitist, interests apart. Elitist. Absolutely. Because the Lord in, High Chancellor. A conspiracy of elites. It sounds like something like Wolf Hall. Well, I'm, I'm, I haven't seen Wolf Hall, but the one thing that I would say is that the people who are backing the Remain campaign are people who've done very well, thank you, out of the European Union, and the people increasingly... Absolutely. So there's a... So there's and, a the people, and the people... The people who are arguing that we should get out are concerned to ensure that the working people of this country at last get a fair deal. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organisations experts. from acronyms the people of this saying, country have had saying, enough of experts had, with, with, from organisations with acronyms saying that they know what is best the and getting it consistently wrong. This because these people, these people are the same ones who've got consistently wrong. This is proper What's Trump politics, this isn't it? No, it's actually a faith in the. It's Oxbridge Trump. <laughs> It's a faith, Faisal, in the British people to make the blind, right decision. Blind faith. I don't think it is, because one of the, uh, the striking things about this debate is that those who are arguing that we should remain have a vested financial interest. Ah, right. So, in the so are they lying? The are Union. they okay. stupid? Or you can watch the whole clip because it gets more and more heated. But what he was saying was really profound. And the survey said the same thing. So they did a survey after Brexit, and they found that the average person in Britain trusted a stranger on the bus for an opinion on the future of the British economy more than an economist. This is the dangerous conf consequence when we have this inversion of influence, because what it does is when people are told not to trust this person or not to trust this media company, it creates a very dangerous vacuum a vacuum for conspiracy theories, a vacuum for people who know how to speak to our feelings versus facts. A people, people like Michael Gove, who represent, in a funny way, an intoxicating form of transparency for many people. And this quote, this is by Bertrand Russell, he's one of my favorite British philosophers, I think it sums up so many problems that we face in the world, when he said, the whole problem of the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser people are so full of doubts. And so it's these three things that are creating this narrative that trust is in crisis. But it's actually a narrative you should distrust, because I don't think trust is in crisis. I think what's happening is that trust is changing form. So an easy way to think about trust is to think of it like energy. So those of you who know physics will know that energy can't be destroyed. Energy is continually changing form. And this is what I think is happening to trust, is that this trust that used to flow upwards to institutions and regulators and authorities and experts is now flowing sideways to peers and colleagues and strangers and friends and neighbors. And what this is giving rise to is profound. And it's profound because it's creating the third biggest trust shift in human history. 
So the reason why it's so significant is trust has only cha ever changed form significantly twice before in history. So for a long period of time, trust was local. So it was when we lived in small villages and communities and towns, and trust was largely personal. So if I borrowed money and I didn't pay it back to this lady, I would get a really bad reputation and the rest of the people in the village wouldn't trust me. Now, when we started migrating to cities and towns and we went through the Industrial Revolution, this type of trust, it didn't work. So we invented institutional trust. We invented corporate brands. We invented risk mechanisms like insurance. We created intermediaries like lawyers and brokers and real estate agents. And trust that used to be personal started to flow through institutions. Now, I'm not saying that these two forms of trust are going away. We will still have local trust and we will still have institutional trust. But there's a third type of trust that is rising up and pushing against institutional trust. And this is distributed trust. Trust that lies in the hands of many individuals versus in traditional institutions. So what I want to spend the rest of my time with you is looking at the consequences of this trust shift that are both good and bad. So how does distributed trust work? So what I've seen through studying all different kinds of systems and networks and marketplaces that are enabled by technology is that it happens on three levels. And the first level is all about trusting the idea, having confidence in the idea itself. So let's explore that first. All right, we're going to do another quick experiment. Um, this one, you, you do have to trust me that it's going to be OK, but it will be OK. I need everyone to take out their phones, even the people at the top. Take out your phones and just wave them like this. <laughs> They're waving their phones. OK, now I want you to swap your phone with the person on your left or the person on your right. But you shouldn't end up with your phone is the basic idea of the exercise. OK, now. Wait for it, wait for it. I'm going to give you, I'm giving you permission. You have 30 seconds to do whatever you want with that person's phone. <laughs> okay, go. 30 seconds. Don't look at me, look at the phone. Okay, you have 10 more seconds. Five more seconds. Okay. Shh. Okay, you need to swap phones now. You need to give your phones back, I should say. All right, I know you'd rather play on the other person's phone for the rest of the session, but that's not the idea. So um, now why did I ask you to do this? I asked you to do this for two reasons. Um, the first is the reason why I love studying human behavior is because we're so predictable as human beings. We like to believe that we're really complicated and different, but we're actually very predictable. And in this wonderful hall, you all fall into three very distinct groups. So the first group, are those that really do not want to participate. And so they either pretend they don't have a phone. I don't believe that you don't have a phone. <laughs> or they take the phone out and they make it very clear to the other person, do not touch my phone. And they spend 30 seconds staring at that other person and staring at me, right? OK, then there's a second group of you, and it's the large majority. And you play along, and you give the phone, and it feels a bit uncomfortable. So right, you're looking at the other person, and you're sort of asking for permission of what you could do with that person's phone. And this is the group that's giggling because you're actually nervous. Right? It's a bit uncomfortable. And then there's a third group, and you are the mono minority. And you, have, you go straight in there, right? Like someone was like, tweeting and Instagramming. and messaging someone other's partner or wife or whatever. But the, the point is that you have a very different relationship with that phone and that person's privacy. Now, why did I make you do that? I made you do it because it's 30 seconds. 
We're in the light. You can see what that person's doing. And yet it feels a little bit uncomfortable, which is what makes so many of these examples where technology is enabling us to transact and interact with total strangers. It makes them so remarkable that they work. And one of these, and I'm glad so many of you use Airbnb because you'll be familiar with, with how it works, um, is a company that's actually very close to me because I met Brian, Joe, and Nate in 2008. And it's an interesting thing. One of the things I love about my work is I get to meet entrepreneurs, and I get to meet them at very different stages of their journey. And 2008 was when they literally just launched Airbnb. And I met them, and what struck me about them is they were so curious about the world. They were so curious about how people traveled and how people interacted. But they also had this resilience about them. It was more than conviction, it was like resilience. And I found this as entrepreneurs, is that those that have this alchemy of curiosity and resilience are often the ones that succeed, are successful. So I came home from meeting them, and I was really excited because I'd found the opening story of my first book. And the first person I actually told was my editor, and he was like, yeah, you don't want to open with that story because that company will be dead by the time your book comes out. Um, but the other person I told was my dear husband, Chris. And I said to Chris, I've just met this company and these entrepreneurs, and I think they're going to be the next eBay. And they have no money, so we should give them our money, right? We should invest in them, right? <laughs> and he looked at me, and he's used to me coming home with my ideas, and he said, so, OK, well, tell me what they do. And the only photo I had was of the air mattresses, right? So <laughs> I wasn't selling this very well. But I said to him, OK, bear with me, because things always start at the lower value of, of sort of the supply chain, and then they're going to move up. So you're seeing air mattresses, but one day it's going to be castles and islands. And people all over the world, they're going to take photos of their bedrooms and their bathrooms and all those rooms they usually keep hidden from guests, and they're going to post them on the internet, and then strangers from all around the world are going to book to stay in these rooms, and it's going to be massive. And he looked at me like... Right, OK. Um, and he said, it's not going to work. We're not going to give them our money. Because strangers are not going to trust one another. Strangers aren't going to trust one another. This is people's homes. And I said to him, you're wrong. Because look at eBay. People buy secondhand cars on eBay, and they don't even drive them. Now, Chris is a barrister. Um, I don't know if any of you are married to lawyers or barristers. But I feel your pain, because arguments are really they're tough to win. because. Your kitchen is a courtroom. And <laughs> he came back, and he made a very good point. He said, eBay is different, because eBay is about online connections. eBay is in a digital space. And what you're talking about is using the internet to get off the internet for people to interact face to face. Now, the interesting thing is that he was right, kind of, because even then, it was really hard, nine years ago, to see how technology would change our interactions with people. And for those of you who use Airbnb, you'll know what is remarkable about it is that it's not just a marketplace for bedrooms and holiday homes, but tree houses. If you own a tree house, you can make a lot of money on Airbnb. It's one of their most popular categories. Igloos, airplane houses, even aquariums. So what those guys saw was how they could use technology to create a marketplace for assets that never had a marketplace before. Now think about the phone exercise, and then look at this chart. Now Airbnb is now the second most valuable hospitality brand in the world. They were at number one. I don't think Marriott liked being number two, so they made some acquisitions, and now they're number one again. And I love this chart. Because I have this chart. <laughs> I have this chart on our fridge at home. <laughs> With a very large pink post-it pointing to 31 billion, saying, always listen to your wife. <laughs> now, <laughs> when, I, when I met those founders, um, there was one thing that really stuck in my mind, and it wasn't the business model. They were so early in thinking about trust, not as a value and an attribute, but as a design principle. And Joe Gebbia, one of the founders, he said something to me. I said, are you building a marketplace? And he said, no, 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 we're not building a marketplace. 
And he said, because so many businesses in this world, they're built around money. And money only goes so far. Because money is the currency of transactions. And what we're building is a company based on trust. And trust is the currency of interactions. And this really stuck in my mind because I always think interacting with companies, how many of them are just based on money. And that's why they feel transactional. And then when we interact with these companies and they feel human, they feel like there's a real person there that cares, it's because trust is at the core of their DNA. So those three founders, they got us, all, everyone who raised their hand in this room, they got us to do something profound, which is what I call a trust leap. Now, a trust leap is when we take a risk to do something new or to do it differently from the way we've done it before. Now, trust leaps, they can be pretty minor things in our lives, but they can also represent really big changes in the behavior, in our behaviors. So the first time we all used eBay and we bought something off, I don't know, someone with a pseudonym, Invisible Wizard, that is a trust leap. The first time we all get in self-driving cars, that will be a trust leap. And the interesting thing about trust leaps is if you actually plot them, so I mean looking at entire industries, you see how they drive innovation. You start to see how trust is actually a conduit for new ideas to travel. You see how we trusted, we went from, we took a trust leap from using barter to using physical currency. The first time we used a credit card details on a website, the people who raised their hands using cryptocurrencies. So trust is actually what drives change. Trust is what enables human beings to take a risk. And whenever you're asking someone to trust, and this could be in your companies, right? So this could be that you're asking your employees to trust a new system. It could be your customers that you're launching a new product or service. Or it could be in your personal life. You could be asking your partner to trust going to some foreign destination, right? It always works in the same way. So there's two variables. On the one side, you have a known state. And this is where, as human beings, we love to be. We love to be in that known state. And then you have something unknown, an unknown idea, an unknown person, an unknown place, an unknown concept. And the line between these two things is what we call risk. So risk is the management of uncertainty that matters. And the interesting thing for me, working with organizations, is they get risk. They love talking about risk, right? Because we do the risk matrix, and we do the dashboard, and the traffic lights, and risk is something that can be measured and managed. But trust is a lot harder for organizations to really get their heads around. But trust is what enables human beings to act. Trust is what takes people, it's the bridge between the known and the unknown. It's what enables human beings to be vulnerable, to place our faith in strangers, and actually to move forwards. So that's why I define trust quite simply, that trust is a confident relationship to the unknown. There has to be an unknown element. There has to be a degree of risk to need trust. Let me share with you um, a quick story that really, I think, brings to life um, what trust really is. So I sit on the board of an organization called the NRMA. Now, it's going to sound very boring, but it's actually exciting. So the equivalent in the US, I think, would be the AAA or the RAC. So we're the organization that rescues people when they break down. And the reason why I think this organization is so interesting is that it's a sunset business. right? So we have to think about how we take that business into the future of mobility. So when I joined the board, um, the CEO said to me, we are the most trusted brand in Australia. We have more than a quarter of the population as members. So I said to him, well, why are we so trusted? And he said, I want you to go into the call center for the day. So I went into the call center, and I asked one of the people there, I said, what's the most memorable call that you've ever taken? And she said, it actually happened a few months ago where this woman rang the call center, and she could hear that she was very distressed, that she was crying. And she said, what's wrong? And this woman was driving down a very long highway, and she realized it's where her teenage son had died in a car crash five years ago. And she started to have a panic attack. 
So she pulled to the side of the road and she called the NRMA. Now what I found so amazing about this is the woman, we found out later, we called her, we said, why did you call us? Why didn't you call your husband? Why didn't you call an ambulance? Why didn't you call the police? She said, I knew you would show up. And our guy sat with her for two hours. He didn't fix the car. He just wanted to make sure that she was okay to drive home. That is trust, that she knew that we would show up. So, how do you build trust? No, the most popular question I get is how you build trust. Now, I'm going to give you, this is a metaphor. I say that's a metaphor because I was recently in Italy and they kept saying, well, what is the Italian equivalent of sushi? And I was like, it's a metaphor, right? Like, it's not about mozzarella cheese or sparkling wine. It's a metaphor, right? So, um, you may know this story, but I, one of the things I sort of started researching, I don't know why I'm writing this book, was the history of food. I, I don't know, I must have been stuck. But um, I found out that sushi was first invented, uh, introduced in the United States in the um, 1960s. And when sushi was first invent, introduced, no one touched it. Until this chef in LA had the insight that it was too unfamiliar to people. So he said, why don't we hide the seaweed on the inside and add some avocado and put the rice on the outside so people feel familiar, it feels familiar to people. And this became the California roll. Now the reason why I love this story is it highlights something really important when it comes to trust. And that is that people don't want something entirely new. They want the familiar done differently. So brilliant leaders brilliant product creators, what they do is they reduce the unknown. They make things feel strangely familiar to people. All right, we're going to the second level of the stack now. So that's all about trust and the idea that you take these trust leaps and the way you get people to leap is you reduce the unknown. But what is the role of technology in all of this? What is the role of platforms? Now, we're going to do another quick exercise. Um, I know fake news is in the news right now, so I thought we would see how good you guys are at spawning what is fake news. So there's three pieces of news, and these are all news, pieces of news, I should say, that have appeared in my Facebook feed. I'd like you to raise your hand if you think this piece of news is fake. So if you think this piece of news is fake, raise your hand now. It's about 90% of the room. Okay, if you think this piece of news is fake about the Pope endorsing President Trump, raise your hand now. Okay, about 85% of the room. All right, last one. Um, Boston Globe, uh, this was after the immigration uh, ban, talking about how deportations are going to begin. If you think this is fake news, raise your hand now. Mm, less of you. Um, all these pieces of content or fake news. And you know what happened to me when I started seeing these pieces of content? Is things started go through my mind. The first is, how do I know if it's real or fake? The second is, where do I go to find the truth? And the third thing is, why are these pieces of content appearing at the top of my Facebook page along with my friend's newborn baby pictures? And what I realized when I thought about it was that I had outsourced my capacity to trust to an algorithm. And this is a huge problem, because what's happening is that technology is accelerating the pace that we trust. So even though the headline is trust is in crisis, we're actually giving our trust away very easily. So I started to look into the numbers um, of what Facebook is actually doing. And by the way, I, I know people at Facebook, I think their intentions are good, and they are working on this problem, but it's the scale of the problem that is so staggering. So I started to crunch the numbers, and so we post around 1.3 million posts every minute, 4,500 photos every single second on Facebook. Do you know how many people moderate this content? 4,500 people. They've just added three more thousand, but that works out roughly one moderator per 466,000 users. So this is the challenge, it's the scale of the problem. And what we're starting to see is this pendulum swift, shift 
against our trust in technology companies because these technology companies in some way have actually become the new institutions. And so the sun is starting to set on technology companies being able to say they're just neutral pathways that connect users or that connect content or that connect supply and demand. And we're starting to see all kinds of regulation around the issue of accountability. So who is to blame when things go wrong? And we're seeing this regulation fall onto two sides. The first is proactive. And this is all about what is the technology, what is the company doing to reduce the risk of bad things happening? And then the second is responsive or reactive. So how do they respond when things go wrong? How are they accountable? How do they take the blame? Now, it's really easy to get lost in this narrative. I'm guilty of it. Like, technology companies, Facebook should be more accountable. The, the, uh, the result of the election is therefore, right? This is a really key point. Platforms are only a mirror of us. They're a mirror of our own behaviors, of the users on that platform. And when things go horribly wrong, when we don't like what we see in the mirror, we blame the mirror. And so, yes, technology companies need to be more accountable. But one of the things I think we need to be doing is actually thinking about our own behaviors, our own responsibility in where we are placing our trust in the world. Because so often in our lives, we let convenience trump trust. I was with, um, in a session the other day, and Uber always comes up, and this woman went on, um, she was obviously felt very passionately that they were the worst company in the world. So I asked her respectfully, is Uber on your phone? She said, well, I haven't had time to delete the app and download Lyft. I said, that process would probably take one minute. Now, I wasn't picking on her because we're all guilty of this. We all let convenience trump trust. Because we're living in this age of accelerated trust, like trust on speed. So um, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a very sad story, but I think this, it brings this point to life. So this is a, a gentleman called uh, Brian, Jason Brian Dalton. Um, the orange suit's a little bit of a giveaway, but he was arrested. He's now in prison. And he was an Uber driver. And you may remember this story. It happened last year. He was driving in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And he shot and killed six people during his shift. Now, the thing that's really tragic about this story is he logged on around 4.30 p.m., and the first person he killed was around just after 5. And some of the passengers noticed that his behavior was crazy. So they called the police. They called Uber. They posted things on social media that if you see this guy, Jason Brian Dalton, don't get in the car with him. He still kept driving until after midnight. No one did anything. And there were two things that really struck me when I went in and I read the response and I read the police reports. One was Uber's initial response. Now, I don't know about you, but he might need a bit of media coaching because his response were, there were no red flags that meant we could anticipate something like this. I mean, overall, his rating was good. It was a 4.73 out of 5. Right? Now, again, it's really easy to fall into the narrative of Uber, a terrible company. But the thing that interested me was reading the passenger reports. When the police said, why did you get in the car? This is Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right? It was all over the news. One guy even said to him, you're not Jason Brian Dalton, the serial killer on the loose right now, and still got in the car. Another guy said, I never thought Uber would send me a serial killer. This is letting convenience trump trust. This is living this age where we give our trust to the technology too fast. So one of the things I think we need to be figuring out is how the technology can actually slow us down, how it can make us take a pause to ask, are we sure? Is this person or thing or terms and conditions or whatever it is worthy of our trust? OK, top of the stack. Um, and this is really about trusting another individual. And the first thing I should say is that the individual can be a human being or it can be a bot, an artificially intelligent machine. 
Now, the, excuse me, the, system, the sister of trust is trustworthiness. So when we say we trust people, it's because we believe that they're trustworthy. And the beautiful thing is that there is a science behind trustworthiness. Many people have studied why do we place our trust in other people. And it comes down to four key traits. The first two traits are what I would say are on the how side of the equation, how people do things. So the first trait is all about competence. Now, competence is really easy to understand. It's like, does someone have the skills or the knowledge or the information to do what they say they're going to do? The second is reliability. And reliability can come down to time, so how responsive you are. It can also come down to dependability. Now, this is kind of table stakes, and this is actually the easiest thing to assess. So I don't know about you, but when we employ people, the questions that we tend to ask are on this how side of the equation. But really, sort of the golden, the golden ingredients actually fall on the why side of the equation. Why is someone doing something? And this comes down to two key ingredients. The first is integrity. And in my opinion, integrity is the most important ingredient. And it's also where trust falls down. Now, integrity is not necessarily about being a good in person, good person. It's about saying, these are my intentions, and my intentions are aligned with mine. So think about situations in your life where trust is broken down. It's often because there is some kind of misalignment of intentions. And then the fourth is benevolence, how much you care. Now this, it may look really easy on a slide, but it's actually really hard to assess in another human being. I mean, you think about Doris the nanny. She was actually competent. She was reliable. You could even argue that she cared. But I don't think her intentions were aligned with my parents. She wanted a base to run a drugs ring. So this is really complicated when it comes to human beings. But it gets even more complicated when we have to trust invisible things, when we have to trust things that are non-human. So I'm going to end with a story. Um, this is my daughter. Um, I know, she looks a bit like me. Um, she's, <laughs> she's a real character. She's actually a real monkey. I'm in serious trouble. Um, and she, the important thing about this photo is, A, she's not pouting. She's really grumpy. And B, you can see that she likes clothes, really unusual combinations of clothes. I mean, she's playing in the garden, and she is wearing two tiaras, because that's what you need to play in the garden, two tiaras. So her name is Grace, and she's three and a half years old. And I like to do um, like little experiments on the no, That sounds wrong. I, like to <laughs> I don't like to do experiments with my kids. I like to test things with my kids, because they are a really interesting age of three and a half and six. And so. Um, I introduced Gracie to Alexa. How many of you have Alexa? OK, quite a lot of you. OK, so for those of you who don't know, Alexa is also known as the Amazon Echo, and it's a speaker. And I put it on the kitchen table, and I said, Gracie, I'd like you to meet Alexa. The first thing she said to me was, is it like Siri? She's three and a half, right? And she understands that this is another assistant. And so I wanted to watch her interactions. Now, I think it's because she's half British. The first thing that she asked for the next two hours was questions about the weather. So we knew it was not going to rain today. Um, and then she asked what I expected. She asked um, facts, and she asked it to play music from her favorite film. So we heard the soundtrack of Sing over and over again, and then Frozen, and then Madonna. Um, and this is, this is really normal, because often the way we test technology is we test it with things that we understand. The second day. She comes downstairs, and she realizes she can order things from Alexa. Imagine you're three and a half years old, and you figure out with the power of your voice that you can order things. Now, luckily, Gracie likes blueberries. She loves blueberries. So she ordered an enormous box of blueberries that she couldn't believe when they arrived the very next day. Still, I, I, I was amazed how far she figured that out. Um, because she can't even read and write. She can't ride a bike, right? But she'd figured this out. But it was on the next day that something really profound happened. She came down the stairs, and she wears this big pink fluffy dressing gown, and she usually says, 
Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Mum. First person she, first thing she said hello to was, Good morning, Alexa. The rim lit up. She said, what should I do today? And then she said, What should I wear? Now, this was profound because Gracie doesn't let anyone decide what she's going to wear in the day. And within three days, she now trusts Alexa to make that decision. <laughs> and what someone's got a three and a half year old up there. And what she didn't realize was that Alexa now comes with a camera. So she doesn't just hear you, she sees you. And because Amazon is launching into fashion, it's in introduced a very helpful style check algorithm. So Gracie could stand in front of the camera and she could wear her tiara outfit or she could wear, I don't know what that outfit is, but the other outfit. And can I, we live in Sydney. Do you think she needs that hat and those gloves? I don't think that really is the case. But anyway, so um, Alexa would then, the style check would say, you know, actually I like that crazy outfit, but you know what, those shoes, they're a bit manky. Would you like a new pair shipped to your home <laughs> or to your school? We are very quick to point our finger at children. Well, what I also love is well, millennials. Millennials are 38, right? They're not children anymore, right? But we're very quick to point and make these general, general, generation generalizations. But the fact is she was doing what, exactly the same thing I had done with my Facebook feed. She had outsourced her trust to an algorithm. But the reason why this is so significant is that we've crossed this line when it comes to trust and technology without even realizing it, in that for a very long period of history, our trust in technology was that it did something for us. It was on the how side of the equation. I trust that this clicker is competent. I trust that it is reliable. It's not on the why side of the equation. But now, technology isn't doing things, just doing things for us. It's deciding things for us. And when it's deciding things for us, we have to understand the why side of the equation. We have to understand the intentions of this algorithm. So just to wrap up, I didn't want to end on a negative note, because this is kind of the cycle and the conversation we're having around technology. And to go back to my question around, can technology make us smarter about who we trust? It can. When we use it in the right way, it can do remarkable things. So I wanted to find out whether my parents would hire Dodgy Doris in the digital age. And so I interviewed all these babysitting platforms. So this one is just Urban Sitter. And they're really, they're amazing when you think about it, right? Because you're not just sharing homes. You're hiring a stranger on the internet to come in your home and look after your kids. And there's two things that are really interesting about Urban Sitter is one, that they figured out the trust signals that both nannies and the parents need. Because the nanny is taking a trust leap by going into the home as well. And so they figured out, you know, seeing who those, um, who would have the nannies that parents has used, or whether that family has a repeat family badge. They figured out these trust signals. But the thing that really interests me is that 75% of all applicants to Urban Sitter don't make it onto the platform. Because they're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to figure out if people are really telling the truth about who they are. And so I asked Lynn, who's the founder, what about Doris? She said, oh, Doris would never have made the cut. Because your parents would have known that she had a criminal history, that she definitely did not belong to the Salvation Army. <laughs> She didn't have a childcare diploma, and that all her references are fake. Now, this is an example of doing what I think technology should do, and that is to amplify our emotional intelligence, to amplify our humanness, to not make the decisions on our behalf, but to give us the information and the tools to make better decisions. I believe the organizations that will win in the future are the ones that use technology to really create efficiency, but the ones that will win will ironically be the ones that feel the most human to us. Now, at the end of the day, the onus is still on us to make a decision 
about where to place our trust. Trust is a human process. Efficiency can be the enemy of trust. What people call friction, I think of as human connection. And so I think we all have the responsibility to think, just to take a pause before we swipe and we click and we accept and we share. And each time we engage in that process, we are in our own small way taking responsibility for the world that we want to live in. And we're taking responsibility to protect and preserve what is society's most precious asset, which is trust. And it also means that none of you will ever hire a drug dealing nanny to look after your children. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Wow. Lots of implications, I think, of what you've just been talking about over the past hour. Uh, we've already got a number of questions coming in. So we've got about, we've got a good chunk of time now, about sort of 15, 20 minutes to delve a little deeper into some of those uh, issues that you've brought up there. Um, the questions are up behind us. Again, if you guys can help me um, help you by voting for the questions <laughs> that you're interested in, um, that would be great. Um, and we can hopefully make this as, as relevant as possible for everyone. They're good questions. Pardon? I can see the questions. So. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, I'm going to just give people a, a few minutes to, or a couple of minutes to, uh, to, to send a few more votes in. And so I'll, I'll kick off with one. Um, what are some of the ways that you think that organizations can go about measuring trust? I'll tell you where I'm coming from. So you, you talked, I like this, that you were talking about money is transactional, trust is about interaction. Um, and it's obviously, it's very easy to, to measure money. Mm. Um, is there a sort of a way that we can start getting trust on balance sheets? So I actually don't think trust should be on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think more trust should be the goal. Um, it should be more trustworthiness. And I say that because you can have more trust in the wrong people in your organization, the wrong things. And I think organizations, they find it much easier when you start talking about trustworthiness because you can start to assess individuals against those traits that I talked about. So how competent, reliability, integrity, and benevolence. And what becomes really interesting is when you start to measure it like that, you see where the pockets of trustworthy people are in your organization. Mm -hmm. And then you can also do that at the company level. And this becomes really interesting if the picture becomes that you actually have a trustworthy sort of workforce, but the organization itself is perceived as, as untrustworthy. So I don't think the goal should be to measure trust. It should actually be how trustworthy you are. Okay. So how can we get better then at assessing those four things, at competence, reliability, benevolence, integrity? Well, well mo the interesting thing is um, most organizations, you ask them, so, well, who looks after trust in this organization? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, or like communications and maybe the risk and governance team. So I think before you can even start to measure trust, um, you have to think about where it lives in your organization. And I'm not advocating that everyone should have a chief trust officer, right? Like that's not the solution, but um, it's really thinking about how trust works and who's responsible for it. And I think it shouldn't exist at the top, that it should be the responsibility across different teams. So whether that's your product team or your customer service team or your crisis team, and then you can start to measure the health that exists in those teams. But when you try and measure it you know, in an organizational sense, what you're getting is actually a measure of, of people's trust in your brand. Um, that's, that's what the survey will show. Okay, great. So um, we have got a lot of votes coming in, so let's go to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, a first up question here is to do with Specifically mentioned startups and small businesses with no track record. How can they build trust with their first customers? I would also suggest this perhaps can extend out as well. You know, if you're wanting to, if you're wanting to launch it, you're an established brand but want to launch a new mm. product or want to go in a new direction. It's sort of how do you start bridging that trust gap that you were talking about? It's a really good question. Um, so so it, it differs depending on, obviously it differs in, in terms of what you're selling or asking people to trust. But mm. um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I, I see is that um, it's a failure to really appreciate that trust has to be earned. And so um, people often think like, you know, you see this like with an insurance startup I was just interacting with, and within the first minute, 
It wanted my banking information. Mm. It wanted to link into my contacts and my Facebook feed and to know exactly where I was by me giving access to its geolocation data, right? That's, it hasn't demonstrated its trust to me. So I think for the first thing for startups is actually thinking about how do you earn people's trust over time? So if you were a banking startup, you could, for example, say, don't give me $100, only give me 10, because I'm going to prove that your money is safe. And so how do you earn the trust over time? And then the second thing is thinking about those signals. So traditionally, um, startups would partner with very big traditional brands. That doesn't have to be the influence now. Um, so you often see like how many people are using this product, or um, TransferWise is a really good example, the, the currency exchange, where in any point in time, you can see the people trading on that platform. And so it's providing people with social proof so that other people will follow. How much time do you think you should give it? It, it really depends on, I mean, you, you start to see when you have it. And, and the interesting thing about these trust leaps is that there is, they're different from, um, people who influence trust are different from early adopters. And so once you see enough people taking that leap, you'll follow. So you, see, you saw this with Airbnb, right? Like for many people, it doesn't, for my parents' friends, it doesn't matter that I use Airbnb. They'll start to use Airbnb when they see my parents use Airbnb. Mm. So it's, you see, I call them trust influencers, but there is this moment when it, it tips. Okay. Question that's getting a lot of interest. How do you start building trust back? once you've lost it as an organization. Something's gone wrong, you've had the massive PR crisis, everyone hates you, What's, what are the first steps in, in building it back? <laughs> you know, the thing, I don't know about you, but the thing that amazes me is, why do companies get it wrong? Like, in the first what, place? No, no, I understand how trust breaches happen, but um, why is the response consistently so bad? So if you look at United Airlines, and, and no offense to be with they're from these companies, or you look at Air Equifax, and I think it, it comes down that there are, there's someone from United Airlines in the audience, I can feel it, I'm not, I'm not speaking about you, right? Um, <laughs> there really is someone from United Airlines, okay, no, I'm, I'll tell you all later, right. don't worry, okay. just keep going. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> My brain has this really bad habit of having no filter. But anyway, um, so what happens is, what companies should do is, the first thing is, is, is time. Um, the response is really important. And, and the biggest mistake you see is that people think they have too much time. And so, and, and I understand this. I understand this from, you know, when, when something happens and the board has to be brought together and then the free and lawyers come in and the communications team come in and there's this big delay. Um, but what you also see is companies sit on this for a long period of time. We saw this with Equifax. They knew before they told people. So the response time is really important. The second thing is owning it and really owning it. And the thing I find amazing is when very large organizations, they point to one person. So, you know, there was a worm or this individual did something stupid. If that individual did something stupid, the system is the problem or the culture is the problem. So really owning the mistake. And then the third phase, which should happen very quickly, is empathy. So show empathy for the human consequence. So often you see companies, and they'll talk about it in a very pragmatic way or practical way without really showing empathy. And then the last is, is what I actually talked about, which is accountability. And this phase of accountability is so important because that restores people's confidence that something has really changed. Because once you've had a trust breach, um, people wonder what's going on in that black box. And they start to question what might else go wrong. So speed, um, owning it, empathy, and then accountability. Picking it up or taking it to the next level, you talked about the decline in institutional trust. Um, talking about how getting trust back, mm. right? Um, and we're moving towards more distributed trust. Do you see a way in which that process can be reversed? Because institutions are still important. We rely mm. on them for a lot of things. And it's, we can't, do, or, or is distributed trust in some sense gonna take over from the role that institutions have traditionally played? No, I mean, I think the irony is that um, this could actually help institutions revive themselves um, to restore their role in society because I think what people see is that we like the idea of trust being distributed amongst individuals, but then we realize there's no net. 
there's no social safety net when things go wrong and that institutions are there for a reason. So I think what's going to happen is that um, we're not going back to that hierarchical, top-down, um, sort of linear model of trust. It will still be distributed, but that the institutions will start to play this net. Um, and that could be anything from people realizing that they have to pay the New York Times if we want proper journalists and, and fact-checking. Um, it, it could be banks that start to become more community-driven. Um, so I think it's actually about institutions adapting to these rules. Um, and the other thing I think is an opportunity for institutions is that, you know, if I was the New York Times, and I hope someone from the New York Times is in the audience now, divorce Facebook, divorce Google. I know it's really hard to do from a business perspective, but some media company needs to stand up and say, the beast is part of the problem. And if we want people to value journalism, we need that independence. So I think that's the other thing is some institutions, thank you. They, they will actually stand up and they will sacrifice the distribution channels for the sake of their independence and integrity and because of their respect for the trust and the truth. Taking that, picking up on that point, a lot of organizations, a lot of businesses use social media. It's mm. an important part, they sell on there, it's an important part of their business model. Perhaps it's not an option for them to just divorce Facebook, divorce Google. Mm. So how can they, what, what would you recommend for them in that situation? Yeah, so I'm not saying like businesses should just give up on social media, but it's kind of um, realized, I, I was talking about media, media yeah, companies, yeah, course, it was different, but, but um, I think it's, it's a case, that's actually the opposite. Um, there you have to realize that if you're using those channels, which I think you have to do, is that you've kind of let go of control of the conversation. You've let, the, the, consume, the customer is now longer consumers. It, they're now social influencers that are gonna define your brand. And in some ways, it's good for trust because it means you have to be more trustworthy. Because if you do something wrong or you believe that you can keep something hidden, that crowd is going to find out really fast and shout very loudly about it. So it could actually be a very good thing in terms of um, companies using social media to see where things are going wrong, to see where trust is breaking and using it to fix things. Okay, thank you. Um how much do we rely, again, a question from the audience, how much do we rely on our rational thinking versus emotions when assessing, assessing the trustworthiness of a person or an organization, I would add on to that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you've got Danny Kahneman coming next, next year. year yeah. um, and he's, if you want to understand this question, just read his books. Um, and if, if you find his books hard, just read Michael Lewis, who writes about Danny's work. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it definitely is emotional, um, and it's, it's, it's very hard to turn on that rational assessment because as human beings, we want to give away our trust. I'm terrible, like I'm like, here's my trust, right? Now screw me. But um, it's like, <laughs> um, and the thing I've realized about studying this is, is I do not ask enough questions about people's intentions. So I, I've felt this with people that I've hired where they don't want to do the job, they want to write a book. And I need them to do the job, so their intentions aren't aligned with mine. And so I think as soon as you really realize that you, you are emotionally influenced and you're not making a rational assessment, and you, you have to write the questions down. So I did this when we hired a builder recently. Um, I know it sounds ridiculous, but like to actually be prepared and to think about how am I going to assess this person if you're making a big investment of them. Saying that, we don't want everyone overthinking, right? Like if we're, we're always making these assessments, we'd never leave the house. So um, I think it's, it's making that assessment when there's something really at stake is really important. And there's another question here, which is the other side. How can you show someone that you're worthy of their trust? Is, <laughs> does that go back to the, it's the, you know, it's the reliability, competence? It is, but um, you know, the, the funny thing is, um, the thing that really is important when you're demonstrating trust or you're trying to earn trust um, is actually about authenticity. So, um, and this is tied to the intentions piece. So, um, you could state your intentions, but they could be a lie. Um, you could uh, say you're really reliable and that you care. And so I think what people smell, and this is back to that emotional piece, is they smell when a human being is being authentic, mm. um, when they're really not hiding something, that they're just showing up. And 
And I think about, you know, I've got this amazing bank manager, and he's, the way he earns my trust is actually that every now and again, he's like, you know what, you shouldn't use our bank to do that. You should go, I can't recommend this, but go and use Os4X for your currency. So that's how he demonstrates my trust, is that he feels authentic, he feels like he really cares. Okay, great. I um, want to go into a couple of examples that are in, in the world today of where trust is perhaps an issue. And the first one here that a lot of people seem interested in is to be cryptocurrencies. Um, you mentioned a couple there in your introduction. What is your opinion regarding blockchain, uh, its role in creating trust, empowering individuals? I don't know if you've done any work on that. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I should say is, is the piece that int interests me is, is not the cryptocurrencies. It's the blockchain itself. Um, and there is there's so much hype around the blockchain, um, but I think the blockchain, within about five years, um, it'll be like the internet, right? We don't care how it really works, so don't worry about how it really works, but um, in the same way the internet's really transformed how we can share um, information, it's actually terrible when it comes to the transfer of value. And so I think what the blockchain's gonna do is allow us to share value um, and to directly trust one another without layers of intermediaries and processes in between. And that becomes really interesting, not from just the perspective of trust, but um, I'm particularly interested in it around um, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I have to sell my book and um, the publishers take 85% um, of every book sold and then I'm largely dependent on Amazon. And what I'd love to do is put that book on the blockchain and that if you wanted to just buy a chapter, you could buy that chapter and that money would directly flow to the author or the artist. So I think we're gonna see it actually transform the creative industries through the monetization of content. Um, the other place which I think is really interesting, um, and I do, I tell this story in the book, is, is I think it's really interesting when it comes to the source of things, um, knowing if that thing, you know, that label on the side, you know, free range eggs, um, whatever it is, is really true. Mm. And so, um, the story I tell in the book is, is about a diamond ring, which I'm not wearing today, but my engagement ring um, that apparently my nana um, told everyone, uh, well, told me that um, we were Russian Jews and we left Russia and we sold all our wealth and um, we took three diamonds and said to my husband that this was the last diamond left and would he put it in my engagement ring? And he did and he said it and a few years ago, I noticed that the, it gets back to the blockchain, but I noticed it was chipping, and I thought, diamonds don't chip. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think my nana was hanging out with Dodgy Doris because <laughs> 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 nana sold Something the, the ring. <laughs> this was the fake ring, so I have a whopping two and a half garret fake ring, um, which is great, but what interests me, um, <laughs> um, I actually love that, but, um, <laughs> What, I, what interests me is, is I went to interview Everledger, which is um, they're putting diamonds on the blockchain, and what would happen is that my diamond that was brought out of Russia would have a, a digital DNA, and that DNA would sit on the blockchain, and I could follow that diamond for its history. And, and you start to think of the applications of that, artworks, fine wines, all these things where you can understand the origin and source of things, and that's, I think, remarkable. Wonderful, thank you. And another application where I think trust is going to be a big issue is uh, driverless cars. I think that's mm. advancing rapidly. Any thoughts ar around that and the role that trust is going to play in the advancement of that technology? You know, driverless cars are, um, some of the most fun interviews I had were actually with the engineers and designers of driverless cars. Um, and, and they are masters in knowing how to engineer trust. And it's interesting because they're working basically with two things. One is, um, how do you make the human still feel in control? Um, and then the second is how do you make the car feel more human, which is why you know, they've got names like Iris and they look kind of like faces. But they're not, worried about, um, they're not worried about earning our trust. They're worried that we'll just give it away, that we'll trust the car too much. And so mm. the thing that they're actually working on is that for the first 20 minutes, I don't know if you've been in a self-driving car, it's really excited, and then you actually get a bit bored. And some people fall asleep. Mm. And so that's what they're worried about, is that we trust the car too much and that the human being isn't alert enough. So I think the trust leap with self-driving cars is gonna happen really fast. And that, you know, my children won't ever learn to drive. 
and maybe they will actually have to apply as a human to get a license that the cars will be so much safer um, that the idea of a human being having a license will be a strange concept to them. Okay. A question here on the link between trust and innovation. Um, how do you see that relationship playing out? If you're doing something innovative, you've got to take mm. leaps, you've got to take risks. How do you see trust playing out in that area? So uh, trust and innovation, they, they are um, like married to one another. And, and the interesting thing is you see this internally and with customers. So high trust organizations are often very innovative organizations. Um, and what they are is that they, they, you talk to employees and they're really comfortable with uncertainty. They're really uncomfortable sort of swimming through this fog of ambiguity. Um, I should say, though, high trust organizations are not transparent organizations. Trust and transparency are not synonymous with one another. So you often hear organizations saying, we will build more trust by becoming more transparent. You've actually given up on trust if you need things to be transparent. I mean, like it's, um, I have a dear friend of mine, she will remain nameless, but um, she says, I have such a trusting relationship with my husband. I'm like, no, you don't. You check his emails and his messages, right? <laughs> but. <laughs> This is what you see often in organizations, right? They think everyone should know what everyone else is doing. That's actually a very low trust environment. It's when teams can get on with things and they can take risks and they can be uncertain with what they're creating. That's what drives innovation. And then one final question to finish. Um, given this sort of new world in which we're living, or this changing world, so um, where we need to perhaps be more aware of trust, trust is, is, is changing, it's shifting, the, the, the digital aspects are, 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 are having such a big impact. How do we need to, like the fake news, we've talked about that, how do you decipher that, how do you spot that? How do we um, need to sort of educate ourselves, educate our children? How do education systems need to change to sort of bring on board or be aware and, and to, to, to deal with some of these issues that you've, you've been talking about? end with a very small question there, Chris. Well, you know, time's up, <laughs> no, so, so. No. Um, Do you know, it's funny, I, um, I think digital ethics becomes more and more important, an understanding of sort of ethical frameworks, understanding um, how to really teach your children to be in control of the technology. Um, and one of my biggest fears as a parent is, will I be able to teach my chid, kids what it means to be human? Um, this is my biggest fear. Um, and, you know, I think this is the hardest challenge is reminding generations of, of what the technology can do and what it can amplify, but what it can't replace in terms of human connection. And I often say to my husband, I think there'll be a dinner conversation where Gracie will come home and tell me that she's fallen in love with a bot. I interviewed someone in the book who'd fallen in love with a book and a bot, and she only knew it was a bot six months later when she kept saying, we need to go out on a date now. Um, and that Gracie would say, like, but he's so responsive, and he always says the right thing, and he really understands me. And real men, there's such a failure in comparison to this robot. And <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious, but this, I think, is the greatest challenge, is, is that we need to think now what it really means to be human, and we really need to think now about how much control we're giving the technology in our lives. Good point to finish. Ladies and gentlemen, Rachel Bossman. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go to lunch now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Rachel will be signing books uh, a little later, and I will see you back here after lunch for our final afternoon session. Thank you. <laughs>